So what is a knot uh, to begin with? I mean, I think we all have an intuitive sense just from our everyday lives of what knots are and, and where they come from. Um, but mathematically, a knot has to mean something very specific so that we can actually study it from a mathematical perspective. Um, and so, you know, usually we think of a knot as something that we can just do with, you know, a string or a rope or a whatever, right? So we think of a knot in, in a way, we think of it as something that we do, right? We can take some kind of a strand and we can, I don't know, tie some kind of a loop in it or something, right? And we think this is what a knot is, in a sense. And in our everyday lives, that's absolutely true. Um, mathematically, it turns out to be easier to study knots if we make one additional insistence, other than being able to do some sort of a twisty-turny thing. Uh, we also are going to take the two open ends of this string and just connect them together. And so mathematically, what we're going to think of as a knot is something like this. So it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end, right? It's kind of like a circle in that way, um, because we've connected the two open ends together. And what we get at the end of the day is a figure that looks something like this in three dimensions. This is actually a copy of the knot that I showed you just a moment ago in our web browser. This knot, who has a name, this knot's called K32. We're going to come up with different names for different knots as we go throughout the semester. In a way, this is the simplest non-trivial knot that we can make. Um, and what we're looking at on the screen in a two-dimensional view right now is what's called a knot projection or a knot diagram. A knot projection or a knot diagram is a way of representing a three-dimensional knot as a two-dimensional drawing. Um, but we always have to keep in mind that any time we're working with a drawing, working with a diagram, working with a projection, all those words are going to be the same thing, um, that what we're seeing is only sort of a, 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 a partial picture of what the knot is, because really the knot is a three-dimensional object, right? And because we can see a three-dimensional object from all sort of infinite and many different perspectives, you might be able to already see how the same knot can actually have a pretty wide variety of different diagrams that we could draw in two dimensions that even though the diagrams all look very different, like this diagram, I would be hard pressed to guarantee for you that this diagram and that diagram actually represent the same knot. But if we can actually hold the knot in our hands, we can just turn it around to see that actually it is the same knot. Uh, and so the first objective that we have for ourselves for today is to somehow come to grips with that idea, right? Where if you look at the knot this way and I look at the knot that way, how are we ever going to know if we're both looking at the same knot? Right? How do we know whether two different projections, two different diagrams, two dimensional diagrams, uh, are actually representing the same knot or whether they might be different? And the differences that we see in those two diagrams, what, what differences are superficial and what differences actually reflect different structure in the knot itself? So the first activity we're gonna do together ultimately the output of this activity, we want to be a set of what I call diagram rules. And a diagram rule is how can I change one diagram of a knot in a small way to get a new diagram which is different, but which we know represents the same knot in three dimensions. This is very much a spiritual successor of what we did back when we studied bradygrams a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so there's a couple places in this activity where it asks you to look back at the work that you did on that previous uh, worksheet activity um, to make the connections between what was happening with the anagram diagrams and what's happening with these knot diagrams as we look at them today. And the output is going to be what we call the three rules of diagrams. So there's going to be three different ways, very simple ways, in which we can change a knot diagram without actually changing the three-dimensional knot that it represents. And those three diagram rules, once we've agreed upon them, if we agree that those are the only ways to change a knot diagram without changing the knot itself, that's going to then give us the strategy that we need for the second half of today's class, which is how do we then attach a property, something that we're interested in knowing about a knot, how can I attach that property to a diagram instead and know that I can use the diagram and it doesn't matter which diagram that I use, I'm studying something about the knot rather than something about the diagram. That I know I'm not just judging a book by its cover, but I'm actually reading the book, uh, getting the plot out of the book instead of making a judgment based on the diagram, based on the cover. Right? Uh, so that's the overall arc of, of how we're going to do today. Insisting that the ends of a knot are tied together uh, 
has the effect of making it so that we can't actually change the type of knot that we have unless we break the string somehow, right? Um, other Outside of doing that, anything else that I can do with that string inside a three-dimensional space, not just rigid motions like rotation and translation, um, but also what are called isotopies, ambient isotopies. There's your fancy word for the day. An ambient isotopy is nothing more than a smooth way of moving one part of a figure into another part of the figure without self-intersecting. So we can't pass a string through itself because they're still made of physical matter, right? Um, and so this activity was all about what gets potentially lost in the translation between any three-dimensional model of a knot that we could think of and the two-dimensional diagram that we use to represent that knot. This is probably not the last day that we're going to be really wrestling with that translation, um, but this is probably the day that we're gonna wrestle with it the most, because after today, for the most part, when we talk about knots, we're gonna start with a diagram of the knot rather than start with something three-dimensional and then fuss about this, this translation, but fuss we shall. Um, so one of the hardest parts about knot theory, right, is that we want to work with diagrams, but we want to understand the knots behind the diagrams. And we've already seen in this activity that there's a bunch of different diagrams that could represent the same knot. And so anytime we work with diagrams, we need to know that we're working with something deeper, something that's not just superficial related to the diagram, but something which is actually a property of the knot underneath. So as an example, here on my on my desk, I created another knot diagram out of string. Well, really, I created a knot. Really, I took this string and I tied its ends together and I put it into some funny configuration, right? So it looks as though this would be a knot. And if we're thinking about knots in algebra, as we are in our semester, one of the things we do often in algebra is take a complicated expression and then apply a series of rules to be able to simplify that expression down in a way that makes it easier to understand, easier to work with. And so the purpose of this activity was to get us to think about different diagram rules that we could use to help to simplify a diagram. If I count, I have in this picture here, let's see, one, two, three, and it's kind of close together, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think I have about nine crossings in this diagram. And so conceivably, this could be a really complicated knot to work with. So the question, of course, is what really is this knot? that I have in front of me? Is there a simpler way in which to understand it? And if there is a simpler way, what are those rules of simplification that could help us to get from this more complicated version to the simpler version? So in this activity, you came up with these three different diagram rules. And each of these rules had kind of a different effect on the total number of crossings in the diagram. The, what I call the first rule of diagrams has the capability of either adding or subtracting one crossing to your diagram at a, at a time. So in the activity, you went from a three-crossing projection of this knot to a four-crossing projection. You added one using the first rule of diagrams. The second rule of diagrams is one that adds or subtracts two crossings simultaneously. So you went directly from three crossings to five crossings without passing through a four-crossing intermediary of any kind. Right? So instantly you get two more crossings, or instantly you get two fewer crossings, depending on which direction that you're going. And the third rule behind my head is a crossing uh, diagram rule that actually doesn't change the total number of crossings in a diagram. It might just change how the various arcs and strands are, are, are situated with respect to one another. So let's go through these diagram rules kind of one at a time uh, and figure out what you learned from each of them, starting with the first one. Uh, in getting from three crossings to four, what did you have to do? What was the sort of simplest way to add a single crossing into this diagram? How would you describe it? So when we were doing this with bradygrams a couple of weeks ago, we had this nifty way of adding a single crossing into our bradygram just by taking one of the strings and doubling it back on itself so that we create a self-crossing. And at the level of permutations, it didn't seem like that changed anything about the permutation that turned sober into ropes, but it changed the diagram, the braid diagram for that permutation by adding a single crossing just by doubling that strand back on over itself, creating a self-crossing. So on the activity, when you started with a three crossing projection of this knot, one of the ways to get to four is just to rotate it in such a way that we create that little loop in on itself that we're seeing right here in the middle of the screen, right? All these other crossings are situated just as they were before, but now we have this one strand that just quickly doubles back in over itself, creating one new crossing. We're gonna call that the first rule of diagrams. The simple way to annotate this, right, is just to think about starting with one strand that actually doesn't have a self-crossing, 
and then just imagining, sort of grabbing a portion of that strand, if you like, and just sort of doing that, introducing that one little loop into it. I haven't changed the underlying geometry of my knot, geometry or topology of my knot. All I've done is I've just sort of, you know, twisted this one little thing inside a space, just that little amount, right? Added a crossing to my diagram without actually changing the knot fundamentally. And so, whoops, I would just diagram that out like this. Right. Just that one additional little twist in there. Um, we called this the one strand loop, I think, when we were talking about bradygrams. But the great thing about this, right, is that depending on which direction that you go, this can either be a rule to make your diagrams more complicated or it can be a rule to make your diagrams simpler. So if I look at this diagram that's on my desk uh, in front of me, find my way back to it. Right? Can you see any place in this diagram where we can apply this first rule to get a simpler diagram for this knot? So the first place that my eye goes is to this, this crossing right there, right? Um, where it really looks like this is a strand that has looped back in over itself. And so all I have to do is just untwist that a little bit, and now I have one fewer crossing. But I haven't done anything to actually change the fundamental type of this knot, right? Because I had, in order to do that, I would have to break the knot, untie it, and retie it somehow, right? All I've done is one of those ambient isotopies. We just move a strand a little bit within three dimensions without moving the strand through another strand, right? But just moving it within three space, and now I have fewer crossings than I had before. And all I did was I applied this first rule of diagrams, which says any time a strand loops back in over itself, we can choose not to loop it back in over itself. And we haven't changed the type of the knot, even though we've changed the diagram for that knot. What about the second rule? The second rule was supposed to be a way to go instantly from having three crossings, for example, up to having five crossings without going through an intermediate step where there's four, briefly. So did anyone have an explanation that you favored for how that process of adding two crossings at the same time to a diagram might work? The second rule for diagrams is kind of something that happens when I take an entirety of, a, of an arc and cross that whole arc over another arc, right, in a way. So I have this inner arc over here on the right. If I just pull this whole strand over to the right, I can make it pass over the other strand, instantly creating two new crossings without actually changing anything else about the diagram. Um, so another way to kind of see this, right, would be if we just have two kind of parallel strands, I can just take one of them and push it across the other, like that. And I create two crossings at the same time, but I'm not actually changing the knot, right? I'm just moving the strand, moving the arc from one side of another arc to the other side of that other arc. We call that the second rule for diagrams. And so in my picture, what I'd kind of be doing here is I'd kind of be taking this blue piece of arc and just pushing that whole blue bow over to either either above or below the, the red arc to create two crossings at once that are either sort of both over crossings or both under crossings. I'm going to draw it as though they're both overs. So now my new piece of diagram kind of looks like that. Right? So I've just slid that whole arc over another arc. Right? And if ambient isotopy is a thing, if I can just move these strands around however I want to, I can undo that and I can do that without actually changing the type of knot that I'm working with. So if I go back to this diagram again that I have on the, the desk in front of me, um, there's maybe a couple places that I could do this, but one that's jumping out to me is this arc here that's kind of going way up and way back. Um, I could just take this whole piece and kind of slide it this way until it's no longer underneath that other arc that was next to it. Right? And so I've just eliminated two crossings simultaneously just by sliding that loop out from underneath another loop. And actually it looks like I can keep going because I again have, it's kind of hard to see here, but an overcrossing and an overcrossing here, which means I can continue just to pull that one apart. And again, I have an over and an over over here that I can use this second rule to make unhappen. And then last but not least, what can I do over on this side? Rule number, one. rule number one, exactly. I can use the first rule of diagrams and just untwist this. And at the end of all of that, I get probably the most important type of knot 
that exists in all of knot theory. It's a knot that is not, in fact, knotted at all. Um, this knot is called the unknot, U-N knot. Um, and it's kind of, for us, the unknot is going to be kind of like what an empty rational tangle was a week ago, right? It's kind of like a starting point. It's the most, it's the simplest possible knot. Um, there may eventually be a way for us to think of it as an identity element inside of some algebraic structure, but it's going to take us a while to get there. Um, all, all that we really need to know about it, right, is that it's the, it's the only knot that we can talk about which has no interesting knottedness at all. It's just a circle, or topologically so, a circle, right? Um, no, we can create a diagram for it using these diagram rules that has no crossings in it at all. Yeah. Cool. And in, that, in this example, we only needed those first two rules of diagrams to make that happen. But there was a third, and the third rule of diagrams is the one which doesn't actually change the number of crossings uh, that we have in it. Um, and it involves kind of an interaction of three different uh, strands at the same time. So how did you, whoops, I to move over to here. How did you describe what was happening in this third diagram move? How are you kind of talking about it to yourself? So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a crossing of the purple and the green strands. And green is over purple in this example. And then there's a third strand that's underneath both of them. So in the three-dimensional perspective, we're kind of looking at a piece of knot that looks like this, right? Um, but when we look at it from this perspective, it looks like there's three crossings. And then what you're saying is it doesn't really change the knot if I just take that strand that's in the back, that gray one, and I just sort of swing it over. So instead of being on the right, quote unquote, side of that crossing, now it's on the left side of that crossing instead. But all we're just doing is moving that gray strand around in space. We're not changing the knot type at all. Um, but the diagram looks different, right? Because in this diagram, we have the strand crossing over on the left of this one. In this diagram, we have the strand crossing over on the right. Um, and in both cases, we have the same number of total crossings, right? We haven't increased or decreased the number of crossings. By the way, something else I should have mentioned at the outset when we talk about diagrams is that we never want this to happen. We never want there to be three strands on top of one another because then I really can't tell from the diagram what the order of those three strands are in space, which can make a big difference if I don't know what that is. So any diagram that we draw should only involve crossings of one arc with another arc, and you never have three at a time. But this third rule um, gets called our third rule for diagrams. And so we'll get that established down here on the page. So it's again, it's a, it's a rule that involves the crossing of three different strands. I have my purple understrand, then I have my green overstrand, and then I have this gray strand that crosses under them both. And to apply this move, all I'll do is just move that gray arc from one side of this crossing to the other side of this crossing. And that gives me my third rule for diagrams. Now, what's fantastic about knot theory is that it's not obvious out of the chute that these three rules should be the only rules for simplifying diagrams. Maybe there's some other complicated thing that involves like five crossings sort of changing all at once, right, that we can do. But it turns out that that answer is no. Um, that if we have a diagram of a knot that's in general position, meaning that we only have two strands crossing at a time, um, that every way in which I can change the diagram without changing the knot can be explained as a sequence of these three diagram rules. That's it. So if I know just these three algebraic, oh, no, I'm not going to call them algebraic. If I just know these three knot laws, diagram laws, um, they are sufficient for me to simplify any diagram into a simpler diagram. Okay? And any two diagrams of the same knot will be related to one another by some sequence of these three moves, possibly done a bunch of times, right? But that's it. Um, and that is probably the one result in knot theory that unlocked a lot of the rest of the study of the subject in the 20th century. Um, Kurt Reitemeister is the name of the, the knot theorist that, that developed the proof of this. Uh, and so these get called the Reitemeister moves. And all these are, again, are rules for changing, a complete set of rules for changing one diagram of a knot into another diagram of the same knot. for changing diagrams. So that's the good news. The bad news is that, in general, if you give me some complicated looking 
diagram with like 76 crossings and it looks like a nightmare, just like, you know, a tangled up string sitting in front of you, right? You would think that knowing that there's just these three moves to do should give us an, like an algorithm, like should give us a recipe for how do I go through and simplify this diagram to make it as simple as possible so that I know exactly what knot that I have. Um, the unfortunate part is that there really isn't a recipe book for doing that um, because it might matter if you sort of you know, do one of your type two moves before the next type one, or you know, the order in which you do them, the parts of the diagram that you focus on. Maybe I want to undo this crossing before I go and I undo those crossings. There really isn't a handy way to do that. In fact, it's such a hard problem um, that even asking a computer to do it turns out to be very hard. It's one of these non-polynomially solvable problems um, to be able to even determine whether or not a given diagram is a diagram of just the unknot. There's no way to tell in, in an efficient computerized algorithm whether or not a given diagram is really even a diagram of the unknot. Um, so that's one of the classic hard problems in all of knot theory. The good news, though, is that knowing that these three are the only ways to change a diagram will be able to give us enough certainty to work just with diagrams for the most part when we're thinking about knots. Um, because what we'll have to do, and we'll do this after we take a few minutes break today, um, what we'll have to do is just demonstrate that any property that we care about, which is a property of diagrams, as long as it is also a property which does not change when these three things are done, then it must be a property of the knot rather than a property of the diagram. So for example, if I only want to, if, if I want to be interested in whether or not a knot is, I don't know, interesting, let's call a property interesting. If I want to know whether I have a diagram of an interesting knot, then it will suffice for me to know whether or not interesting diagrams remain interesting after we unloop them, or after we undo -si do them, or after we undo this little maneuver here, right? If interestingness does not change under any of these three steps of a diagram, then we're not talking about just interesting diagrams, but that interestingness property would then apply to all possible diagrams for that knot, and therefore that property would apply to the knot that's underneath. So I want us to take a five minute break and then we'll come back and talk about that idea that we call invariance uh, and get our first taste of what an invariant property for a knot would look like with a much, I think, lighter activity uh, to wrap things up today.